glad you could all be here this evening for this debate, which will be moderated by my colleague, King McCarthy. Um, this is just the very cursory announcement to thank you all for being here and tell you a little bit about this project, which is a three-year project that we're running on the future of Europe, really looking at Ireland's role in an EU that might change very significantly after the UK part. Now, obviously, that has all been thrown up into question, but we've persevered because we do believe that the future of Europe debate is a crucial one to have in Ireland. So this is what we're trying to attempt with these events, and we're delighted all our panelists could be here. And with that, I'll hand over to Keane. Thank you, Alan. So yeah, my name is Keane McCarthy. I'm a researcher um, at the Institute of International European Affairs, and I work specifically looking at, at topics on the future of Europe. Um, and I'm very delighted to be joined uh, by this panel uh, here today. There might be a few familiar faces um, to some of you. We have, uh, me to my right, we have uh, Timmy Dooley, TD, who is the Fianna Fáil spokesperson on on communications, the environment, and natural resources. Natural resources, which of course is a very important uh, topic right now. Um, and he's also previously served as the party's spokesperson on transport, tourism, and sport. Um, and also, um, some of you might not know that Timmy Judy also has an important role within the European context, um, as he is the vice president of the European political grouping uh, called the Alliance of Liber Liberal Democrats of Europe, so an important role at a European level. Um, then to his right we have Deirdre Clune, MEP, uh, who is an MEP here in the South constituency um, for Ireland uh, since 2014. Um, she's a member of the Parliament's uh, Transport and Tourism Committee um, and also is a substitute in the Employment and Social Affairs Committee. And Deirdre has also uh, held many other different ranks of political office, uh, served as a TD for Cork South Central, uh, Senator and was also the Lord Mayor uh, of Cork. So, a uh, huge amount of political experience that we hope to draw out uh, of her today during her comments. Then we have Stephen Kinsella. Uh, Dr. Stephen Kinsella uh, is an um, uh, Associate Professor of Economics uh, just at the University of Limerick here, here um, and a Senior Fellow at the Melbourne School of Government. And Stephen also um, is an award winning columnist, I'm sure some of you have encountered his columns um, with the Sunday Business Post. And um, he got his first th uh, PhD in 2007 from NUIG, and then went on to do a second PhD in 2011 uh, in the New School for Social Research in New York. So I suppose between us we have two PhDs. And then uh, Katrina Cahill, finally, uh, Dr. Katrina Cahill uh, is the economist for the Limerick Chamber. Um, and prior to this, she also worked in the University um, of Limerick um, and has also worked as a researcher, uh, executive researcher in the Department of Enterprise trade and employment and got her PhD from the University of Denver. So it's a really interesting panel I think today. We have a good mix as you can see between the political side um, and the more academic side and hopefully uh, there'll be a good discussion. Um, I'm going to just kick off by asking a few questions um, to our panelists and um, we'll have a little discussion and then there will be an opportunity for uh, members of the audience to ask your questions uh, to any of the panelists. So hopefully we can have a, an open and interesting discussion on the future of Europe. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have been engaging somewhat in a news basis with Europe when it comes to Brexit, of course, but there's still a lot going on at a European level this year that I think it's very important that people keep an eye out. Uh, there's the European elections are happening in May, um, and following that there'll be changes to all of the European institutions, including uh, the Commission, which is the executive arm of the European Union, um, and also um, a new president of the European Council, which which, which is the meetings of the heads of government of European leaders. So it's a very important year for the EU. But one other thing that's going on that we're going to focus on a little bit today is the idea of the EU budget. Um, the EU budget is run in a seven-year time frame, and the next one is starting in 2021. And the negotiations are ongoing at the moment. And I'd like to turn to you maybe first, uh, Deirdre, on this topic of, of the budget, because a lot of people say that the European budget is, is the, the future of Europe in numbers, really. It's taking the priorities of the EU and, and putting some numbers on it. So within that context and within your experience in MEP, I'd be interested to hear what do you think are the priorities that the EU should be looking at in the next seven to ten years, even longer? Um, and are there new priorities that we should be looking at? Uh, yeah, you're right. We're discussing the future, future financial, financial situation, the future budget, and there's lots of debate in the Parliament commission even at council level. And you asked the question, what should the EU be looking at? And I suppose um, I can, uh, there's a conflict between what the EU should be looking at and what Ireland should be looking at. Um, I think 
there are certainly have been changes in the last five years, new priorities that were foreseen in terms of the fight against terrorism, uh, cyber security, intelligence sharing, all of those are pri priorities now. Climate change, action in that area has become a priority, and dealing with migration are a major, a major uh, challenge. And they have, these have, if you, look, if you look back five years ago, I was standing in an election campaign and they weren't priorities at that point. But things have changed and we all know what, what, where that has come from the last five years. For me, uh, as, a, as an individual representing Ireland South, uh, I absolutely think uh, agriculture policy is really important for us. It's about 38% of the budget now. Um, it is really important. And, and, and it's useful that Hogan, Commissioner Carrie Davis has produced a potential reform of the CAP and how he would see it implemented. Uh, and that's for, the, for up for negotiation and it's going through the committees of the Parliament. But it was very useful in that consultation and the level of awareness from consumers, not just the rural communities or agricultural communities, the level of awareness and recognition of the need to support the policy that pays has direct payment to farmers to produce good quality food and we know where it's coming from and the of the story behind the food that we have, which is a premium product, but it costs money. Um, so there is a, an acceptance by from consumers, but that, that is unfortunate. So I, I, one of my priorities it has to it has to be, and I think obviously it's reflected in the budget as well, is the um, the cap for the common agriculture policy has to be maintained. The others are very going to be very important as well. The Horizon 20, Horizon 2020, the research and innovation program, which is going to be the next phase, we call it Horizon EU. Um, for investing in research and innovation, I mean, our third level sectors have been extremely say, active in this area, attracting funding. So that's very important. And if we're going to, you know, I mentioned cyber security, I mentioned fight against terrorism, investment in research is going to be important. And the social fund. Now, for, for us as well, for us, yes, uh, the most particular countries, the full social fund to focus on youth, youth unemployment, and social inclusion. Um, I think they would be. You see this priorities, of course, you've got digital transformation, you've got all, all the various programs. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be one or, one or the other, but I think they're some of the, that would be the highlights for us um, in this country. And, you know, the debate is, the debate is going on. And of course, the big debate is about, is about um, are we going to fund it? Are we going to pitch in more? Are we going to cut programs? You know, are we going to I increase our contributions post, post UK? When they're gone, there's 12 billion a year, which is probably the estimate. Where's that going to come from? Holding, holding the budget, increase member states' contributions or cut programs. I mean, that's the reality because the European people, I think sometimes speaking to people, and uh, I think that Europe is, you know, has all this pot of, pot of money to distribute, but in fact, it comes, the money comes from the member states. So that's the challenge. And <coughs> thank you. Jared, I'd like to turn to you, Timmy, on that question of, you know, the member states and, and the as a, as a whole acting together and then at, a, at an individual level. Like one very important issue which I know you work on is the issue of, of climate change and there's a huge growing public demand for action uh, on uh, the issue of climate change. Do you think then there should be a joint European response to this which could even include you know, financial assistance at the EU level to countries or is this really something that member states should be doing by themselves on their own terms? Well, I suppose the short answer is that we need both. It will have to be done at both European and local level. When you consider that the European bloc is responsible for some 10% of greenhouse gas emissions, and some of the impacts of those emissions will be felt uh, beyond the borders of the European Union uh, and will, have glo will and, and continue to have global impacts. So we have a responsibility in the first instance on an individual level and national uh, and at European level as you know, advanced economies. Um, to alter in a very significant way the way we live our lives. Um, and I think, no different to our debate about the future of Europe, wh when we start to talk about climate change, we have to move beyond the academic discussion and the scientific argument. Uh, and to some extent, I find in, in, in addressing climate change issues, um, whilst the public are accepting now of the science that sits behind it, perhaps pol at political and academic level, we haven't started to discuss the practical implications of what climate change is going to mean for an economy. And we somehow maybe pull back a little bit because I it is very significant in terms of the, the, the impact that it will have on economies. And it's not just about a couple of grants here and a little bit of pairing back there. If we're to reach the targets 
uh, of net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and I suppose from a political perspective, we see 2050 as a long way off because it's, it's outside, you know, it's, 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 it's a number of political uh, electoral cycles away. But the kind of policy decisions that have to be taken now domestically uh, with the support of the European bloc uh, are significant and are going to have to change, you know, assist people in changing very significantly. And what we've got to be careful in doing that, and that's where I suppose the, the European budget comes into play, we've got to be careful that we don't leave communities behind. And I'm conscious even what's happening in Ireland at the moment with the moving away from the burning of fossil fuels for the generation of electricity, as is happening at the, in, in the Midlands where uh, Borden and Mona have, have brought forward their, their, their deadline for the um, harvesting of peat and the impact that that's going to have on, on communities there. There are uh, deadlines in relation to the, the ending of the burning of coal at money point for the generation of electricity, which is set at 2025. Now, all of these decisions have significant impacts on people's lives and on the economies of the region because there are significant people employed in those sectors and that's going away. So we've got to work together to ensure that we don't leave behind these mini rust belts which have had their own political destabilization in, in the United States. And we, we've seen the rise of uh, you know, that, that, that populist agenda of, of President Trump. And we see some of that emerging in Europe for different reasons. But what, what we don't want to see is that climate change becomes a further catalyst in the European context for a much greater level of, of our, our assistance towards the continued rise of populism uh, and that re-emergence of, 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 of a nationalism which undermines the whole uh, foundation of the European Union. And I think uh, Deirdre will, will, will probably have more visibility on this than I, but th there is real concern um, amongst the European parties about the rise of, 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 of populist parties and any of the polling that has been done would, would seek to suggest that the formation of the next parliament will be dramatically different uh, to, to the current one and the, 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 the shifting uh, of the balance of power towards a, a greater role for populist parties who have you know, clearly indicated their desire to, to undermine much of of, of what's happening within the European Union at the moment. So those are, those are things we've got to be really careful of. And that, that's why I think we, citizens in, in, in states like Ireland who see an agenda of climate change coming with it, targets agreed at European level, that, that it can't be the old story that we blame that on the Europeans uh, and at the same time seek to maintain the architecture that, that you know, so much time has been invested in, 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 in building up. We call and said there that we need to move a little bit away from the academic debate, but nevertheless, I'm going to move over to the academics here. Um, <laughs> it's very important. One, I, I just mentioned the idea of this whole idea of the EU budget, which is something that's done over seven years, but another proposal that has come out uh, specifically from President Macron of France is to have a Eurozone budget that would be specifically to deal uh, with matters concerning the 19 members that use the Euro. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about this idea and how it maybe differs from the traditional budget? And how do you see this working? Does it have implications? Could it end up splitting the EU between the, the Eurozone members and the non-Eurozone members? Is that, is that a fear? Yeah, I mean, it's essentially uh, France, uh, under President Macron, has been on a, a deep integrationist track. Um, and uh, I, I think what, what his proposal is essentially is that there's more fiscal power. So fiscal is from the Latin fiscal, which means Purse, right? So the idea is to increase the amount of the purse that the Eurozone has to spend. This is exactly what we needed to do during the crisis. The, the, you know, we needed the Eurozone to be able to spend money and to, to build you know, bridges and to build roads and to uh, improve schools and that kind of thing in order to get us up out of the, the crisis. In, in fact, during, the, um, during the, the crisis, it said the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. right? So the idea is to build in the kind of capacity to do things at, at a structural level at, at, between those 19 euro members because the euro right now is incomplete. It's a, it's a fiscal union, but it's not a, it's, it's a monetary union, but it's not a fiscal union. So we, have, we, all have, we, all, we all have our euros, but we don't contribute to European pot in the same way that we contribute to uh, the amount of money that Pascal Donoghue actually gets to spend on a, on a, on a, on a, on a yearly basis, right? Um, now, the, that we're all okay with, well, most of us are okay, well, 
none of us are okay with giving Pascal Donahue some of our money, right? We do it because we realize that the state doesn't run unless we give him some money. We also realize that if we don't give him the money, we go to jail, right? So, the, so, so there's this thing of, of we vote in parties, the parties appoint ministers, the ministers are given seals of office by the president, and that gives them the legislative authority to actually spend the money, right? Which is fine. Uh, and the, the issue at European level is that that is diluted somewhat, even though there is actually a lot of dem dem democracy involved in, actually in the generation of the European Parliament and, 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 uh, and uh, members of European Parliament and so forth. But the idea is to create a, a more federalized fund. Now, that means your taxes go up, right? There's no other way to say that. Your taxes just go up. Now, maybe, maybe they don't look like they go up. Maybe spending goes down somewhere else and we make an increased contribution, right? Or maybe uh, uh, we defer some grants so they don't come down fast enough. But however you split it, your taxes go up. Now, I would argue this is an entirely good thing. I was not a fan when we joined the euro. I didn't think it was a great idea because we didn't have this fiscal integration. But now we're in the euro. It makes no sense not to have this. You need the fiscal firepower for when the next crisis happens. Th so my, my, I, would, I would be very much a supporter of that. However, how, uh, this comes back to, to Timmy's point. How do you tell, how do you, how do you not tell people, but how do you uh, uh, get people to understand the idea that th not only is their money going to, to Marion Street to be, to be uh, uh, spent on schools and hospitals, but how do you get them to realize this is now going to Frankfurt? going to Strasbourg. And it's not a contribution of 1.27% of our, our, our budget, right? We're a net contributor now. It's maybe a little bit more. Right? And, and again, we're a small country, but we're a rich country. Right? We're one of the highest, richest countries in the world. So this is the kind of contribution we should be making. And uh, then how much of a say do you get when you, uh, uh, and what, uh, what, what, do you, what do you get a say over? Uh, you know, we can't have an Albert Reynolds moment you know, people of a certain age will remember Albert coming back and going, I have X billion reasons for you to vote yes to this thing, right? Mm. Um, uh, how many X? What was the X? I can't keep seven. Seven. I have between seven billion reasons. Between seven, seven and eight. Remember there was, yeah, yeah, was yeah, it yeah. seven point eight or was yeah, it eight point two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I forget the exact number, yeah, but, yeah. but we can't. I, I think that's probably the wrong way to go about it. Mm. Okay. And then how about then, Dr. Pinkal, about the idea of a European monetary fund, which is similar enough but a little bit different, where it's more a rather than having this fiscal union, you just have a pot of money that's a rainy day fund or a bailout fund and other ways of putting it. Is, is that a solution, do you think, or could that create uh, other problems? Yeah, the idea of the uh, European Monetary Fund, is, it's kind of been around since 2010. Um, and it was put on the back burner then due to the fact that if you wanted to establish an EMF that was similar to the International Monetary Fund, it would require changes to the treaty. And that's quite difficult to do. Um, so what they did instead was in 2012 they created the European Stability Mechanism. Um, and they did this in, by basically entering into an international treaty between the Eurozone members. Um, and in effect it was an organisation of, I suppose, public international law outside the EU. Um, so in terms of what they're suggesting nowadays, um, if we were to have an EMF, it would be characterized by effectively bringing the uh, ESM back into union law, changing its name to the European Monetary Fund, um, and giving it a few add-on tasks. Um, and, you know, the reason why people want to do this, um, if you think about it, is that currently um, the crisis manage management governance structures uh, are very are overly complex. Um, they're very slow. Um, and the reason for that largely is because it's the European Commission who has responsibility for crisis management. Um, and in the context of that, if we look to, to Germany's solution, so Germany thinks that you know, by creating this European um, monetary fund, that this will solve this problem because effectively 
the European Monetary Fund then takes over from the European Commission in terms of looking after structural reforms and also in regards to fiscal rules. So Germany is all about um, risk avoidance. Okay? But then you have France, who are very much about um, cooperation and risk sharing. Um, and the idea, I suppose, that, that they've put forward is obviously they want to take policies, the social policies, economic, fiscal, and they want to harmonize them. Um, and the idea behind that is that they very much want to have a Eurozone budget. You know, they want that to be funded by Eurozone-wide taxes. They want it to be managed by a powerful European Minister of Finance and Economy or whatever title they're, they're trying to apply. And they want it to be controlled by a Eurozone Parliament. Um, and I think that if we look towards what's been suggested, I do think Germany's idea of having um, a credit line for countries that are affected by external shocks um, is a good idea. Um, and obviously that works with there's conditions that are applied. I think um, the suggestion has been maybe for a five-year period, I think it's five years, it was suggested and put forward. Um, but obviously it would be capped and it would have to be repaid in full. Now, you might ask the question, but how is that much different to what's there at the moment? And you know, would it make any difference? And the answer is that it, it can potentially, but where that rests is in uh, the connections of the conditions to the policies that are put in place. Okay? Because um, if we think about it currently, what you have sometimes is this ex post kind of monitoring, okay, where we try to enforce particular structural reforms and policies after a crisis has hit, or post a big event, where the focus should be more on ex ante policies. So we're looking for these countries to adapt in a particular way before they would be given access to this credit line. Um, because you might not realize it, but the, the current uh, ES. Um, or EMS that we have at the moment, they actually offer two precautionary credit lines, but no member state has signed up to them. And the reason for that is because there's this perception that it sends a negative signal that the country is preparing for, for a shock. Yeah. Um, so really what we need to be ensuring is that the perception of this has changed. And instead what it needs to be is that signing up to access the credit line is instead getting a stamp of approval that you have had strong policy over a sustained period of time, because that's the only way that you're allowed to access the credit line. So I think if something like that comes into play, it does have the, prevent, like, the potential to support, I suppose, against um, coordination failures against in, in financial markets, and by extension, help prevent later with, with, um, with economic crisis. I also have an issue with the, the monetary aspect of, of the name change because it's misleading. You know, the ECB has particular um, responsibility over those areas that we associate with the term monetary, you know. And I, I get why they want it, because they want it to be a, an international monetary fund, a comparison to that. But if you look back in history, the International Monetary Fund it originally was called the International Stabilization Fund. And it was actually John Maynard Keynes who put pressure for that change to take place because at the time, the word stabilization was associated with previous stabilization um, packages that had been implemented for exchange rates. You know, when Britain was obviously, you know, they went through a tough time with pegging their currency to the international gold standard. So they wanted no connection with the word stabilization. So that's why it was changed to monetary. But those connotations don't, don't exist today. Um, Thanks very much. And here, John, I move back to the, 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 the budget itself. You mentioned this idea of, you know, increasing the budget or, you know, do we keep the same? And there's been a little bit in the news uh, recently, I think I saw it yesterday, about this announcement that Ireland is increasing its net contribution to the budget. And sometimes I see this as met with mixed reactions uh, by some people because for example, I was uh, in, in Poland recently and I met with somebody from the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and they are net um, beneficiaries of the budget, which means they get more money back than they put in. And they're saying, we want, by 2025, to be net contributors. And most people think, wait, you want to lose money? You want to give more money? Because they say, yeah, because then we're part of the club of contributors. So do you see it like that? Do you think really being a net contributor is something that Ireland should be proud of? Something we should say this is buying influence? Or does it also hurt the idea that we're actually losing money to the European Union. Well, I suppose, 
No, I don't see it that it's, uh, I think it's, 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 it's a good thing, it's a sign that our economy is strong. I mean, at one point we were recipients, we were net recipients, but now we're in a stronger position, so we're net, net contributed just, just about, but we're in that bracket. Um, uh, and yes, I going forward, we will be we hopefully c continuing in that way. But I think it's very important that we realise um, it's not just about, it's not about what the money bag, it's about the benefits that you receive from collective decisions at EU level, such as, well, like, but for us, I mentioned the common agricultural policy originally, and I think, I, I, in, was it the Auditor CNAG report yesterday on two, 2017? So the, I think 80% of the funding that we receive goes, comes to agriculture, rural uh, development fund, the CAP and rural development fund. So. That's, so that's very important for us. So in the debate that's going on at the moment about the next budget, um, we really want, and we're tr trying to get a lot of countries on board in this to make sure that the cap budget is maintained, at least maintained. So that's very important for us. And I think then you, you have to realize like we benefit from the synergies around the Horizon 20, the investment program, research and innovation. We will benefit from that. So th even though we're net contribute, I think we would benefit the, the benefits will be greater than our actual contributions, and that's the way we have to, we have to look at it. Because we're in a, it's not a club, but we're, we're in a, this union with 27 member states. Well, 28, soon to be 27. So we're in this union, and it's collective, uh, and and we we benefit more from it. Such as um, in defence, security, so we will benefit from that. You know, and, and we we can't do, we're not we are an island, but no man should be an island really. So um, I think you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably it's going to be. Um, it, it's going to increase more. I mean, the projections are that our contributions and the gap between what we receive is going to increase more. But we've, we have to make sure that the funding to the programs that benefit us and the, uh, you know is, is maintained, and that, that that that's the way to look. I mean, the UK, you know, we know they're they're net. They were uh, uh, obviously a net contributor for a long time, but they benefited enormously. They're f from the research and innovation program enormously. Their universities were top class at and still are top class at it. And one of their priorities, if we do get to the situation where we're you know, discussing a uh, future arrangement with the UK, one of their priorities is to pay to be involved in the um, in the research and innovation program. So it, I think it's about um, it's about where your priorities are and to ensure that those programs okay. are funded. Yeah, just, just in terms of research and innovation, just to give you a really concrete example, right? Horizon 2020 is an absolutely gigantic pot of cash, and mm -hmm. Irish universities, like we're about to become the largest English-speaking country in the European Union, right? Um, and what's really, really interesting is uh, the University of Limerick has uh, been quite successful in Horizon 2020 money. So we just got a, a 21 million euro award, of which 6 million euros is going to Limerick, to Limerick City. So 6 million euros is going to come to, to change the Georgian city, uh, parts of the Georgian core, to make them positive energy districts, right? Um, I'm obviously scratching a record while I'm giving this talk. Yeah. And so, so what's really interesting about this is like that's, that's money, that's jobs, that's changing the, the structure of, the, uh, of what we've got. And as, as Timmy said as well, like, you know, we, we, th this is the Georgian core, which is a 200-year-old piece of architecture, which is going to become a, a net contributor into the um, uh, energy system in, in, in Limerick. And that, that is world-class research that's happening in Limerick. It's literally happening down the road, right? Um, and it, it would only be possible because of the European Union and the Horizon 2020, because there's no Irish pot of money that's anywhere near this size. We're just not big enough to do it. And 20 million euros, not that lot, uh, it's not that much money. We're doing it with uh, uh, Trondheim and Norway and a couple of other places like Limerick and Trondheim are gonna be the, the two lighthouse cities for all of Europe in this. So it's a really interesting here now example of the, the power of this Horizon 2020 thing. And its next, its next iteration, it was framework three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. They, more a great gig and Quinn actually rebranded it Horizon 2020 for some reason. Now it's called Horizon EU, EU, EU right? 2020 to 20 to next year. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, EU, Horizon EU is the next yeah. 2021. Yeah. 20 so, th so this and is... With, and with yeah. increased funding. Increased funding, so mm -hmm. the universities are going uh, the universities and and uh, the private sector working together to do something really really innovative here and so the the more we get involved with this the better we will all be and i, I think i can't stress that enough it is a key uh, strategic thing for the university of limerick it's something we really really want to get involved in and uh, the more we do of it the better it's going to be just for limerick yeah. just you know it goes back to the point that, that stephen made at the outset about seeing ourselves as 
the net benefactors of cash as it were from Europe, we often lose sight of the fact that access to the single market is one of our biggest uh, advantages in terms of our capacity uh, to attract foreign investment that has allowed us to uh, increase our employment specifically in the Midwest. And, you know, we've positioned ourselves very well because of our university sector, our general education sector, our English language um, speaking capacity to attract the foreign investment, particularly from the United States, that has allowed so many of those uh, major multinationals to position themselves here and gain access uh, to the single market. And as a, th that often gets, gets lost in the debate, it's probably brought into pretty sharp focus now when we're discussing uh, the exit of Britain from the Union and the implications uh, for, for, for Britain in terms of maintaining uh, their investment profile. And we saw, notwithstanding, deals that appear to have been done with the automotive sector by the government soon after the initial vote, that they haven't stood the test of time. And we have seen in recent weeks Nissan indicating uh, that they weren't going to continue to produce one of those, uh, I think it was the Nissan X Trail or whatever, uh, in, 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 in the Midlands. So, you know, we, we have to, we, we, I suppose we have to re-engage to some extent to see what the real benefits of our membership of the union is you know, on, on, on a commercial and an economic basis rather than just the cash to do the roads, which we all became familiar with and took for granted the fact that much of the employment that has succeeded in changing the face of the west of Ireland, um, e even from the time that I grew up out in County Clare, just to see uh, the propensity of, 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 of the growth of um, foreign investment uh, and, and the associated jobs just right here between Limerick and Shannon. Uh, and the, you know, what that has allowed you know, people to come back and live and work in this area. You know, of course, we could, we could start arguing amongst each other dear, about how well that is working or, or isn't, but that's, that's the politics of it. But the, the big picture um, is really the fact that we have access uh, to, the, to the single market. And of course, as, as Deirdre has rightly identified, that has transformed Irish agriculture um, in, in, in really in, in, in a huge way and has allowed you know, so many more people to, to remain in, this, in, in, in these rural parts. Katrina, I'd be interested on that point of, of you know, Ireland really taking the mantle of this small, open, globalised economy. Um, yesterday, the European Commission announced um, or released their country reports and, and one almost criticism of the Irish economy is that maybe we're becoming a little too dependent on foreign direct investment and a lot of our indigenous companies aren't building up. Do you think there's a, ba a balancing that needs to be done? Like with your experience in Denver Chamber, for instance, I'd be interested to see. Definitely. Um, just, just to say as well, just because it extends into this point that we've, we've gotten a lot out of the EU, um, but there's potential there for more. Um, because with Chambers Ireland, we, we traveled to Brussels the last week and we got a, a few briefings while we were there. And it was made very clear that Ireland is quite good for submitting applications under the Horizon funding system. But there's other um, funds that are available for urban innovation. Um, and so far, they, up until just this year, they hadn't received any applications from Ireland. They received one from Dublin for just the next funding level for 2019, okay, which I found quite shocking given the fact that our regional development is so important under our national planning framework. You know? So there is untapped potential there, and it is something that we need to use in order to balance our local economies as well, because you know, we know from Limerick that we had an over-reliance on, on one particular company going back to 2009, um, and we did. And if we look at this, the statistics and the economics back in that point, Okay. We had a situation where manufacturing represented about, of all people employed in Limerick, represented over 35% um, of where our employees were based. If you look at the Limerick economy now, um, what we'll see is that we don't have any industry that over 20% of our employees are employed in. Um, so now we've, we've diversified our economy. Um, but we need to do more. That's on a Limerick level, you know. So this, we need to expand this more because we do have an over reliance on on multinationals. Um, they obviously create it's job creation. They bring a lot of benefit to the country. We don't want to cut them off and say, "Lads, we're grand. We're only going to <laughs> we're only going to grow our, our indigenous yeah. industries now." That's n that's not what I'm saying. But it definitely is. It's a balancing act, and it's all about implementing the right policies. 
but we can't successfully implement those policies if we don't have the implementation mechanisms which all boils down to funding and the EU is core for that you know in terms of regional funding for us and and getting to that point I think I might uh, open the floor to some questions from the audience and um, if anybody is ending on I think it's a, I'd like to reiterate that if, don't be afraid to ask what you might consider even a basic question about how these things work or you know about something that's going on in the EU at the moment um, any question would, would be great and we'll start to hear this gentleman here Hello, Edward Horgan uh, to ask Deirdre Lewin in particular why are Fine Gael and the four MEPs from Fine Gael in particular advocating the end of Irish neutrality joining PESCO joining the European Army which will have huge cost implications for the Irish taxpayer as well as implications for our soldiers serving overseas they will no longer be able to benefit from Irish neutrality which is a life-saving issue for Irish soldiers um, well, Fine Gael, actually the Dáil has voted to join PESCO. Uh, so Fine Gael MEPs are, are, didn't have a say in that, but I, I would have supported it if I was there. And Fine Gael, in, 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 there are four MEPs, you're right, we produced a policy having looked at having worked in at mem being a member in the last uh, five years in the European Parliament. And we see uh, the need for Ireland to participate in uh, defence and security issues, because security uh, is, is very important now and we can benefit enormously from uh, participating in security on a European basis, similar to the discussion we've just had, the synergies that are there and the economies of scale, we can benefit from that. We are not, are in no way, are are undermining Irish neutrality that's recognised in the treaty, but we do want Ireland to continue in a peacekeeping missions, and we're very proud of the Navy service we have and the activities that are going on in the Mediterranean at the moment in helping in rescue missions there. Very proud of the contribution we make at a UN level, and we want that to continue. But we have, and, and, and that's it, it's not about uh, our neutrality, I recognise that we're military neutral, but in some areas we need to cooperate more in order to protect our citizens here on this island and our citizens when they travel across Europe, because we've seen in the last number of years the rise in terrorist attacks, the threat from cyber security, there's none of us immune from it and no business, we've seen what happened to the HSE and you know, there, there is just, there is no, no, nothing immune uh, from some, from the threat that is there from cybersecurity, and we need to participate at a EU, le EU, EU level in that. And that's what our, our policy, our policy proposal was about. PESCO is about participating in missions uh, as, uh, that, that are in line with our neutrality. And um, already since the Dáil has approved PESCO, uh, uh, Irish uh, Gardaí and military personnel have participated in, in training exercises to equip them to deal with the threats that uh, that can be that, that can only they can only benefit from the um, the synergies as I say that are there at, at a European level. So that's probably the policy that's been misinterpreted, but that's what it's about. Okay, thank you. Yes, gentleman there at the back. Pesco oh, sorry, if you could use the microphone. Pesco is a military alliance, <coughs> and if you read up on it, as I have and we have, it is the first step into a European army. <clears throat> now, there's no point in trying to deny this. We were told this was for various things like humanitarian stuff and um, missions across the globe and all the rest of it. But in actual fact, it is a military alliance. And it is stated by the big powers in Europe that a European army will be put in place. And we are uh, we're already have our foot on the first step or maybe the third or fourth step but please don't insult our intelligence by telling us it's not a military alliance it's a scandal that our country could take such a step without consulting the people of Ireland it was sorry just just to repeat pesco and Tim, you were you, you, you is a member of the doll it wasn't I know, it was it's not it's 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 been passed by the doll so we can't respond. we can't have the debate well you can have the debate but it's not, it hasn't been passed it's nothing to do with the european power it's 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 a, it's been passed by the doll it's a national decision and you participate in missions that are aligned with our neutral position not every mission we participate uh, similarly our participation in the un peacekeeping uh, 
peacekeeping rescue and human humanitarian rescue missions. And that's what we do. And I think from what I know and from speaking to Irish people, they are very proud of the contribution that our defence force does make in those areas. But um, and, and that's that's where it is. So I, I mean, I, I, I would have if I was a member of the Dáil, I would have supported that decision. We were but I wasn't. Excuse me. We were already involved in peacekeeping. We were already involved in, in uh, saving migrants and the rest of it. And Mr. Dooley's party was, gave it the big nod, why were not the people asked their opinion on it? And why? And if, if you're so insistent on our neutrality, why is it not put into our constitution? I've been asking politicians this for the last five okay, years. I get a fob off, people burning down the clock on me. Why is it not in the constitution? If you're insistent okay, well, we have that a we politician are here neutral, who, who we're going to have one, one, last word, one last word on this. To my knowledge, the, the, uh, our position on military neutrality is a political decision, and it has never been in the Constitution. And, and that would reflect on why the Irish people uh, weren't, weren't offered uh, an individual opportunity to vote on it, as they're not generally uh, on policy matters. Uh, th 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 there isn't generally a vote about specific policy matters. But I'm confident that our position of military neutrality still remains enshrined uh, at, 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 at policy level. And as you're aware, there's a, a, a triple lock mechanism whereby if, if, if the Irish state is to become involved in any issue uh, in terms of, of participation, it requires a, a government decision followed by a decision of the Dáil. And in the first instance, it would have to be uh, a UN mandated uh, requirement. And so those protections uh, are there, um, and, and they have stood the test of time. And in my view, uh, you know, the issue that you raised, whilst you have a different opinion to me and others, and you're entitled to it for sure, but it doesn't, in my view, infringe on the position uh, of neutrality as we understand it. Okay, sorry. Thank you, sir. We're going we're gonna to move on. There, sorry, there, You'll be happy to know that the IAA has produced some brilliant papers on this topic, um, some of which might be available here, some of which are available on, the, on our website. So we're going to move on to a new issue here. Yes, sir. Um, I thank the other two for the question. Uh, I do respect your opinions, but I'm about to be sworn in as a reservist next Tuesday, and I'm a hopeful uh, cadet. Um, I actually thank PESCO because it's about to improve my pensions and it's about to improve my pay. And I do not feel that it impedes on my neutrality. Now I'm going to move on with a different question, other than PESCO. Sure. <laughs> um, what is the EU going to do in new legislation, maybe, uh, for the disadvantaged areas that may have voted for Brexit? Does anybody in particular want to... I think we're just using the hand mics now, but oh, yeah. if just you want to, however mic. you want to deal with it. Uh, the disadvantaged areas that may have voted for Brexit are, are they're the areas that are leaving, or do you mean disadvantaged areas anywhere across Europe? That could be disadvantaged areas that uh, would have tended to be likely to vote for yeah. Brexit. Type of yeah, and, and, uh, and I suppose the issues around why did people vote for Brexit, um, probably dis globalisation is an issue, so um, it would be one of the issues. Uh, there is um, a big emphasis on, I mentioned the European Social Fund when I came, you know, when it was spoke at the beginning, and there's a big emphasis on providing funding to um, to retrain people, to reskill them, that, of, that, that will require obviously jobs in the area as well. But there is a strong focus on upskilling uh, retraining people, lifelong learning, the European Globalisation Fund, which um, has been mentioned in the context of of um, of the Midlands and the closing closing down there of um, sorry, if the names of the bogs. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's got gone my head. There's uh, the European Globalisation Fund there, that a direct fund to help individuals to support them in the event of a globe that globalisation. Uh, should 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 affect their employment situation. Now, I think that, in my view, that was a, a lot of the issues um, that people felt that their jobs were gone and that this was all about. And Europe bringing in, you know, there was people coming to their country, probably, um, and they felt were d displacing them in their communities. So, um, there is a, a, a realization um, that we need to. You know, some those of us who think we know, who, who think everybody understands what's happening in Europe and understand globalization is there to stay. Uh, we think that everybody that that that's that we've realised that not not everybody understands that, and that people need to be helped, and that you have to maybe take it take a step back and slow it down 
and help people and uh, bring people with you and help them in their in their situations because not not everybody is going to benefit from a growing economy as we know. Did you want to answer that, Stephen, as yeah. well? Or? So, um, okay, or I think we we'll just use this. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that I, uh, one of my jobs is I run a project called uh, Rebuilding Macroeconomics with the National Institute for Social Research in the UK. And uh, we, I run a project called Has Globalization, or Can Globalization Benefit All is the, the name. And we fund projects within the UK, but also across Europe and um, in America. In, and, and one of the things we're looking at is basically compensating what I in economics you call the losers, right? So, so basically trade increases, um, tra tra trade increases uh, overall welfare, and that's great, but some people lose out because manufacturing moves and services move and so forth. Uh, one of the really interesting things about that, is, about these new strands of research, is that they're showing that there's this really interesting and like very nuanced connection between social groups and uh, the behavior of these massive multinationals, right? So uh, when we talk about globaliz uh, globalization, we really mean the increased interconnection of markets. And that actually happens through big companies, global value chains. So like, you know, your, your, your iPhone is made in about 10 different countries and they all connect together and they create value by when somebody like pays for your phone, right? Um, but there's this really interesting thing is happening in Switzerland and Germany and other places. Uh, it turns out that the largest increase in manufacturing employment in the world is in Myanmar, right? And uh, that's because they have absolutely no labor market regulation, right? So people are happy to work these, one of the, some of the poorest people in the world, half to death. And uh, many of these companies are Swiss. So uh, Swiss uh, civil society, in the same way that um, we would have activated civil society for the repeal, uh, movement or for, for, for the same-sex legis legislation or for other uh, movements like abolishing water charges and so forth, um, they got together and they said, this is against our national identity. They said, we are Swiss, we follow the rules. That's our national identity. You are Swiss. You're a Swiss multinational. You are not following the rules. You must change your behavior. And the Swiss multinationals are saying, yeah, but we're making loads of profits. Is that not okay? And they're like, no, that's not okay. Right, so they're changing the rules. And this is happening not just in Switzerland, but in Berlin and other places. So we're funding research to actually go and check out and see why that is. So you've got civil society that's actually coming up and saying, there is a problem, you need to solve it. And they're, they're, they're activated before there's a, like a big Brexity referendum thing, before we go, oh my God, this is a disaster, right? And I think it's really interesting that it's not coming from the political system, it's not coming from academia, although there are obviously a elements there. It's coming from civil society. And I think there is, there's something about that that I think is really powerful that we haven't seen before. It's, it's, it's genuinely new. Um, and uh, the only thing that's even close, I think, is the suffragette movement. And you've got to go back a fair whack of a way before you get something as transformative as that. So yeah, I think, um, I think there is a lot going on. And, uh, and there is a fair, fair whack of money, in fact, um, there to help solve some of the problems. In the second row here, this gentleman. Um, does the panel feel that the rise of the say there, uh, just so everybody can hear you. Uh, does the panel feel that the rise of the right-wing and nationalistic type parties in Italy, Hungary, Poland, and maybe certain elements in other countries has been uh, caused by some of the actions by the EU, and are they a threat actually to the long-term stability of the EU? And is there anything that the EU can actually do to, you know, count, counter that threat? It's mm. so a good question. Is, is it a backlash to a lot of the EU policy? Does anybody have a yeah. take I think there's a couple of factors. Um, I think Stephen's rightly identified globalization being, 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 being one of the ones that has been kind of simmering beneath the surface. We've, we've all been looking at the positives uh, of globalization um, without really identifying uh, the threat uh, that existed as people's um, stake in society or loss of value perhaps um, emerged from it. And I think the what happened in the United States with the election of Donald Trump, uh, you know, largely identifying that that rust belt zone as being those that were forgotten by globalization and you know this idea somehow that you were going to recreate a steel industry and a coal industry despite the fact that everybody had moved on was somewhat offering a solution that that, that we shouldn't have believed in or we didn't believe in but 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 certainly people who had nothing were prepared to take a risk and and, and yes that's that's part of the problem of globalization i think some of the issues that are also emerging at european level has been the 
the perceived threat of migration and a belief that the 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 um, level that that people had within an economy was threatened by uh, the broadening uh, of our our borders and the opening up of our uh, of our borders to people from outside who were in a much more desperate situation. So to some extent, we had lost our sense of wanting to reach out and help people who were in really bad state and people becoming a little bit more protectionist. And, and that tends to happen as people get better off. It's in a society where people have more disposable income, um, that they feel they want to protect what they have, have achieved. And, and maybe we're somewhat... Um, the downside of our, of our success is that we have created a people or, or we have allowed certain people to believe that, that they don't have the same responsibility to the less well-off uh, outside our shores. And then you get along come somebody like Nigel Farage, which, which, which we're aware of, uh, and others. Um, what's happening in Hungary and Poland is a, is, is, a, is a little bit more subtle, but it's going the same direction. Um, and you've always had you know, some, some, some difficulties in Italy, but again, focused primarily on the, the, a reaction um, to the migration that has largely been as a result of, 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 of the war situation uh, in Syria. What can we do about it? Um, I think we've got to hold fast on the principles that, that and, and the guiding principles uh, on which the European Union was founded. Um, I think responsible parties have to uh, speak out and speak up uh, uh, and, and seek to continue to maintain those, those principles rather than seeking to try to, you know, uh, in some way respond uh, as, as, as the others m m might expect. Um, and I think that's where the challenge will be, that we set out you know, what Europe's about, what we're trying to do, um, how you benefit by sticking with it rather than allowing it to, in, in times of difficulty, uh, to just start, start looking within our national uh, borders. I mean, I think we've seen how we came through the difficulties of our own uh, economic crash. Some might argue that we didn't get the support that we might have expected from the European Union. Um, others might say that we were, we were well supported and as a result of that we're, we're now back in a, in, in, in a strong position again. Whatever you position you take on, 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 on that particular outcome, we're certainly better working together around the principles of pooling and sharing our, uh, our sovereignty, but most importantly, ensuring that we continue uh, to respect the basic rules of law, which unfortunately is not happening in, in Hungary and Poland, and we see those that, that regressing. I think the Union have a responsibility too to challenge that. Uh, and I think the likes of, of Viktor Orban and others uh, need to feel, to some extent, a level of isolation for their continued, um, their continued propagation, if you want, of this capacity to be part of the union, but yet apart from the union. Uh, so there's, there's going to be a job of work to be done um, on the other side of the elections. Yeah, um, you, you spoke about right-wing and the rise of right-wing. Um, uh, I'd be very fearful of it, and I am, and I think it's going to be, uh, you can see it now in well, in Hungary and Italy as well, right-wing parties are in government, Netherlands um, almost made it, but will be there, and Nigel Farage is, is as well. Um, and a lot of it, from what I see from, mix, from the work I, where I am placed, is, uh, t is, is a reaction to migration and the migration crisis. We can speak of it here but it has been enormous, the impact on some communities in like Greece, Italy, Malta, Hungary. That's where they closed down their borders. At one point, I remember speaking at the height of the crisis to a colleague living who, was, who had been mayor of Salzburg. She's a member of the parliament now. And at every point in her small town of Salzburg, there was two to 3,000 people per night sleeping on county or city hall floors and school halls as they're moved through Europe. So... If we had that wave uh, of migration through this country, I think um, it might be we might have a different reaction to it. So, what has ha what has happened since? Well, it has it has thankfully the, it, the huge wave has 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 it's not it's not this, not to the same extent it has reduced, but there's still migrants are coming, and we see the stories of people victims of smugglers or people smugglers they're being uh, in the in the Mediterranean Sea, as as I spoke of earlier on. But uh, what has been uh, what the reaction to it is, you know, Europe recognised that 
it's this point of that you have open borders in Europe, which is great, but like it, it doesn't make any sense. Then you need to control the external border. You need you need to develop a system, and you need to be practical about it, a system where, where you have legal migration rather than illegal migration. Now, I'm not talking about refugees from Syria at all. I'm talking about migrants from ec economic migrants or climate migrants now at this stage. Uh, but we need to be, you know, we can't have open the doors all the time. We need to or have every door open, but you need to develop a system where we have legal migration. You need to help wi work with Africa. And there's an African trust has been established now, whereby um, th it's, it's three billion this year. And previously there was funding to help it to work directly with education facilities, uh, developing governance, uh, helping countries there. The, I'm, I'm a member of the EU Africa uh, Alliance and we meet tw twice a year at summits. But, um, so, and, and maybe we've heard the story before, but I think in the last five years we've seen changes in this area. And unless, and like last weekend in, um, in Egypt, there was the first uh, European Arab summit, the first time ever. And that's the, the thinking behind that is we have to, you, migra migration isn't going to go away. It's, a f it's something you can deal with and say, that's it. We've thrown money and it has gone. No, you have, we have to work with it and we have to work with it as a union. And um, because from it has come, the rise of um, nationalism and Angela Merkel reminded us when she spoke in the Parliament last September that she saw she said like the rise of nationalism was the start of World War One and World War Two, and are we going to break up the union that everybody has worked so hard to build? Um, we need to understand where this nation rising nationalism has come from and work to to address it and to redress it. Yeah. And Katrina, I'd just like to bring you in here, just bring that idea back to the the money topic because uh, do you think? in any way has the EU's economic policies brought about a bit of a backlash? Because, you know, it's, I'm sure we can find consensus in the group, for example, in the polar situation that we all agree in the idea of a judiciary and democracy and the rule of law. But in the example of Italy, for example, that the commission is now censoring Italy because they're spending more than 3% of their uh, budget to GDP ratio, that's not a hard and fast economic rule. So what, is that an example of the EU, you know, going a bit too far or, <laughs> You know things like inflation targets, all these economic areas that have a have an ideology behind them. Do you think that's something the EU should step back a bit on? I think it certainly feeds into it, but I think sometimes, you know, particularly when it boils down to economics, like the whole migration um, debate, you know, at, at the epicenter of that is it's economics, you know, and it's kind of discussed and it really frustrates me in some aspects where it's used for scaremongering tactics in a certain way. And, you know, we have to understand that, yeah, there are downsides to cert to migration in some seven in terms of pressure on our resources, you know, there's, but there's this scaremongering around, you know, loss of jobs or, and I, I can understand the social aspects with pressure on hospitals and schools and things like that. I, I understand that. But there's also benefits to migration as well. You know, there's particular skill sets that we, absorb within our economy when we have people come in from other countries because you have to remember that a lot of the poor countries some of these individuals are highly skilled particularly around medicine you know so we are getting some skill aspects coming in there definitely are economic elements that have been imposed particularly we're like I'm, I'm gonna I want to introduce the millennial <laughs> aspect here okay and the fact that you know because of particular banking rules that have been put in place the pressure now on millennials to be able to afford their own house or to get access to funding from banks because of the lending rules you know there is going to be a backlash around that there's always you're always going to try to blame somebody you know but i think as well that i know around people i am a millennial and i know around people my own age the the ignorance around certain topics as well you know we just seem to lash out without trying to understand you know is this actually something that is being directly imposed by the eu or is it something that our our national government has you know decided that this is a policy we could potentially implement you know and sometimes we don't we don't directly understand that we place blame where it shouldn't be placed um but i do think yeah we, there is that economics is at the core of a lot of the the backlash we get nationally for certain things. We have about, about 10 minutes left, so what I might do is take a, a few final questions and then I'll give the panelists each an opportunity, opportunity to either respond to them or, or just uh, wrap up. So, yeah. yeah. Um, my name
name is Jason Fitzgerald. I'm currently seeking a Fianna Fáil nomination to contest the European elections, but I, I suppose I just want to make three points. Um, I suppose the first one is directed to Steve in, in regard to the fact that the, the debt to GDP ratio of the world is about 300% and the um, German economy is at a standstill. Um, what effects will, s uh, will say, squaring the circle between a, f a fiscal, um, fiscal rule and a monetary rule have effect in Ireland, and bear in mind the CCTTB? And also the change, the proposed changes to the rules to go from a unanimous voting issue to a, I would say, a quality majority. Um, what are the hidden dangers in that? I suppose the second point there is basically, uh, Deirdre rightly pointed out that a, over 80% of our budget is in food and agri. The concerning thing to me is the competitive and growth area um, is only just over 10%. And I suppose two um, things that really light up is the strategic the European Strategic Investment Fund of over 500 million hasn't been tapped in for the last three years, um, no, called the Juncker Fund, um, and also, unless it has been in the recent last year, and also, I suppose, the, the area of um, major infrastructural funding as well hasn't been tapped in. Bear in mind that Brexit has happened in, in 2016, the vote, and we're here preparing for Brexit. We haven't accessed that funding. And the third point there is basically, in light of the news today about the Shinraza, and the t we said the 16 or 19 children that are not um, allowed access to that drug on a cost basis, isn't the time that we had an EU drugs program where all, all these drugs that have been passed by the European Medicines Agency are available to all citizens at the same price. Okay. Um, I, I might just take all the final questions and then we'll wrap up. If you no don't worries. Mind, for time. I'm going to have to work hard to remember that those questions. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Stephen stole my lunch a little bit, and Timmy, to a certain extent, uh, wh when you mentioned the, the Swiss, and I think if, if, if the Swiss ever get an opportunity, they should mention it to Pascal O'Donoghue about Apple and their, their 0.5% tax. But in any event, my point is one we started off with, and, and populism. And Timmy referred to, you know, that we have to stay fast with the fundamentals of the EU. And with all the research we do, and, and this plays into Brexit as well, the biggest mistake I think Europe made was that the morning after the English referendum on Brexit, that they didn't turn around and say, hang on here, we've made a mistake, we need to talk to you, even at that stage. It should have been done beforehand, but instead of which, the politicians in Europe threw petrol on the fire. Now, I'm convinced that we're, we've missed the bus by probably 10 years in terms of this populism thing. And, you know, I think the research we should be doing is we should be asking even our own people, what's the problem? Because there are problems with, with a lot of, lots of problems with Europe. And, like, the PESCO people here, I, I would support them 100%. I'm not here because of that, but I would support them 100%. But there are lots and lots of problems that the research should be asking people what is wrong with Europe and how far back do we need to go before we get rid of this populism? Do we go back to a European, an EEC, and, and, and bring it back to there and, and let us all work away in peace? Okay. And I think that's, like, I think we're in serious, serious trouble in Europe and, and Brexit is only a smoke screen covering okay. it up. Thank you. Any last ones then? I think there's two more. Is that the only two left? And then we can move to final ones. Okay. Yeah, my, my name is uh, Joachim Fischer. I'm, I'm lecturing in languages in UL. Um, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen said that um, post-Brexit, um, uh, Ireland is going to be the largest English-speaking uh, um, country in the European Union. Th that, that's correct, uh, but there is another way of looking at the linguistic situation, and that is uh, that the number of native speakers uh, in the European Union is uh, going to drop down to 1%. Um, so... Um, in, in that context, uh, I'm, I'm, and, uh, it, it, there is no question that English will remain the main language of communication. I, I don't doubt that for a second. Uh, but I also doubt uh, that there will be absolutely no linguistic consequences uh, to uh, this new situation. The, uh, in the sense that the uh, percentage of German speakers, French speakers, uh, Spanish speakers, it's all going to go up. This is just numbers. This is just statistics. Um, and uh, in, in, that st in that context, uh, I'm wondering uh, whether we do enough uh, to address this language. There is, of course, uh, there is the language as policy, and uh, that is a great document, um, but we're always great at policies. Uh, the implementation is, is, is a different matter altogether. Uh, and there is even, uh, uh, and I know this, this uh, meeting here is addressing um, economic matters first and foremost, but there is, of course, a, uh, an economic dimension to this as well. Uh, 
because our links, our economic links with the continents, uh, continent uh, are going to get, uh, uh, become more direct. Uh, we're, we hope to be selling more directly into the uh, continent, uh, bypassing, bypassing Britain. And in that context, I always think of Willy Brandt, uh, who, when he was chancellor and interviewed uh, in English, uh, he, he said, uh, if I want to sell to you, I'll speak English. Uh, if uh, you want to sell to me, then müssen Sie Deutsch sprechen. Uh, and uh, there, there is a point to it, you know, even though we're moving, uh, I, I, I fully accept that uh, we're uh, in, a, in a language, that, in okay. a linguistic situation that is dominated by English. Thank you. I think there was one more question here. Did you want to? I actually feel a little bit bad going back to the very first point that we actually had about was on the Macron setting up the um, European funding methods. Sure. Yeah. The one thing I would actually have with that is, does it not just kind of just put a band-aid on the problem that exists? Like, the way I would kind of see it is, you can approach a crisis in different ways, not necessarily one is better than the other, but wouldn't it be the institutions that need to be stronger to deal with it and actually have the ability to do it? Wouldn't it be more better to focus on those versus than just saying, let's create a fund for when things eventually screw up versus let's see if we can strengthen the institutions so they can actually deal with things and respond? Okay, thanks. So I think I'll just give everybody maybe a chance to either deal with specific things there or, or do any concluding remarks. I think, Stephen, you got about 16 questions there, so I might start with you. You had, you had squaring the circle of fiscal policy, CCCTB, QMV. Um, would you like to deal with any of them specifically? <laughs> right. Okay, so one of the best things about doing something like this is I always learn loads. So thank you very much. I had never, I've been writing about this almost on a weekly basis and tweeting about it and you know talking about it, I've never once thought about the linguistic consequences of Brexit. So thank you very much for that. That's brilliant. Um, I was talking with somebody today about the, the idea of a European drugs policy. One of the big problems that we have in Ireland is that uh, with a highly uh, responsive political system and a fairly weak technocratic system, uh, when somebody comes up, uh, when somebody comes up with a, with a kind of a relatively emotionally um, connective story, and it doesn't. I'm not necessarily talking about Orkambi or any of uh, of these important drugs. What I'm actually talking about is that's how our system works. Our si and you could talk about it in terms of nurses' pay or pick anything, right? As long as it's, it, it is sufficiently emo emotionally powerful and has a sufficiently concentrated uh, uh, a group of people around it, and uh, has ha has 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 a bit of uh, public support, pretty much will increase spending on the thing, whatever the thing is. This is grand as long as the thing is not rapidly increasing in price. So that's what's happening with medical inflation. So you have the structure of our current system, you have vast increases in medical expenditure, and you have a health system that's in, in a bit of a problem. So we've already spent, it, it's week nine of 20, 20 six, yes, uh, but, uh, we're already finished with our, uh, the increase in our drug budget. Like, it's actually finished. We're, all of the increases that we have planned to spend on new drugs are now over. We've done it all. So do you think we're not going to spend on new drugs for the next while? Of course we are. So uh, should it be done at a European level? Absolutely, because it avoids this issue. It also stops the problem that we have here, it, which is a lack of economies of scope. We're not big enough to say, no, no, no. If we vote, if we if we buy as a block, and we should, then we would get the kind of price discounts that they get the, at the NHS. It would also mean, by the way, that people who want life-saving and expensive drugs would have a very different process to go through. Right, so that's an, another. Im there are there's a positive and a negative uh, uh, to that. The uh, on the co common corporation tax base um, is this coming? Absolutely. About 40 to 60 seconds after w the Brexit thing is sorted, <laughs> approximately 62 seconds, somebody's going to go, yeah, but that corporation tax lads. Right, that's the next thing. Like, be aware. That's the next thing. It's going to come. To be fair, it kind of should. Right, if we're it, 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 it kind of should, but that removes a very significant um, advantage uh, that we have. It also, by the way, stops e people like me getting bashed over the head with it everywhere we go, right? Um, and I am, I, I personally, am looking forward to that because I think we can compete uh, w without it. Um, what was the next one? Sorry. 
Yeah, so the European Investment Bank is an extraordinarily uh, powerful engine. It's probably responsible for all of the increase in, in, in expenditure in higher education, for example, in Ireland, or almost all of it. Um, it's been extremely powerful. Should it be doing more? Absolutely. And it, during a crisis, it should be doing three times as much, which answers your question. The reason that you would do it is because in a crisis, like you can compare Ireland and Nevada, yeah? Both, both are small places that, had, that uh, have one big city where there was a housing crisis, right? And... Ireland went, lads, you need austerity for the next 10 years. And Nevada went, here's some money from California. Game over. That was it. right? So it, it solves that problem institutionally without needing to worry. It's automatic fiscal transfers. That was it? Do I get like a prize or, <laughs> you know? OK, cool. Right, OK. OK. Yeah. <laughs> well done. And well, I, I won't go back over all. Just a few things. Um, you mentioned EIB and their investment. I mean. They are there and they're crying out for projects, and, but they're here in Limerick, investing in the regeneration of Limerick. Shannon Foynes has received funding from the Connection Europe Fund for developer to look into uh, to for its, its jetty extension and the rail link. So there is funding there and, and there is funding coming, but it's a matter for the member states or the local organisations or the relevant authority to seek that funding and to, to work with it. And I think actually, from an Irish point of view, we need to work as a, as a, as a, as a, as a national unit rather than Shannon Foynes, uh, Port of Cork, Dublin Port doing their thing, or you know, every we can need to work together s on that um, as a unit. And I think you're stronger, stronger like that. Um, I, I'd absolutely uh, on on the cost of medicines. I think there is something being done uh, to for, to improve purchasing power. You know, it's it's easy economy to scale. We're a small country. Something being done at European level, and it's not it's not a European issue. It's more a, a few li like-minded countries um, getting together to improve their their purchasing power. Uh, but obviously, um, um, and it's a, b a benefit that we should, uh, we should, uh, we should use as being members of the European Union. There was uh, so oh, populism. Um, populism is something we could have, uh, we could be here until midnight discussing. Uh, what is it? It's, it's, it's simplistic. I think it's simplistic. It takes time, and you need to react to it, and you need to explain. And we, you know, you do hear a lot about populism, blame the EU for everything, and should we be better off without the EU? But would we be, look where we've, far we've come, would we be better off, you mentioned uh, in Mumbai, the uh, working conditions there, you know? When we, before, when, you know, we have, uh, we've spent time um, recently working in the Employment and Social Affairs Committee on the Working Time Directive, work-life balance, we've just completed it, um, looking for flexible working, maternity leave, paternity leave, paternal leave, holiday leave, uh, you know, would we be doing that if we weren't members of the European Union? Environmental protection of our waterways and our air, would we be, would we be doing that? We'd be, I don't think so. I think we'd be dragged kicking and screaming, but nobody would be dragging us. We'd be on our own. So I think we need to um, you know, understand it's not just all about economy and single markets. And ben it is. It's, that's very important. But there are other areas that we need to, and I, and I need to do it, and Timmy, and we all need to be doing it, because be people who come along here obviously have an interest in, in the European Union, trying to understand it. And we all need to be doing it and explaining, and it, it takes time, but you have to counteract the negatives with real facts and with, with reality. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion looking at Macron versus Marine Le Pen in their presidential election, and he just stayed calm. He kept reacting and counteracting and counteracting and countering with facts and with reality, and um, he wore her down. And if you look, you look back an analysis of all those debates, uh, she wasn't making sense, and, and, and statements she was making had nothing whatsoever to do with the European Union or decision making there. There were national, local issues. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a, a battle there. And on the languages, the question, I hope I'm not missing any question, but the languages, yeah, the working language in the, in, is, is English now, you, but, but we need to be doing, we absolutely, as a country, we need to be doing more. We, I mean, I'm embarrassed. I have my leaving certificate French, and I, I try and survive on that. I don't have, I have Irish and English. I don't, I'm not very strong on my Irish, because since I left school, I don't speak it. But, and, and I'm not blaming the fact that we study Irish, but there's some people, or lots of people, and those are Europeans, they all have a very strong second and third language. And if we're going to be a country, the only English, a small country trying to, su not survive in Europe, but benefit in Europe, uh, we need to have a, we need to do something about our languages. I mean, I just, just as a follow on uh, in relation to the populism to, 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 to Michael's point, um, just because most of us in this room believe in the European Union, recognize the tremendous benefits that it has been to our economy, to our people, to our social life, and to all aspects of life, does not mean that everybody else gets it in the same way. Um, because, and it speaks to your point about the millennials, 
and to a different generation that, uh, you know, it's not about taking for granted, but they have never known anything different. Uh, and therefore, there's a job of work, a continuous job of work, to explain where it has come from uh, and the real benefits. And also, to, you know, that it, it's not the solution to all our problems. Um, neither is uh, a regression into a sort of an individualistic or, or a nationalistic approach to uh, the management of our economies. So I think we need to continue that debate. And, and, and as, as uh, Deirdre has said in relation to Macron versus Le Pen, we need to challenge the, 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 the populist uh, leaders. I think much of it is coming from people who are deeply concerned about their capacity to uh, educate their children. Um, like we can see to some extent how even within our own economy, a certain, a certain element of the middle class has been hollowed out. So, so, and it's just the way wage I inflation has gone or hasn't gone for some people. Uh, somebody who had a decent job in Ireland, maybe in, a, in the ESB or in the old Aircom or was a mid-level civil servant, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they were reasonably well off. They could know that they could educate their kids, they could live out a decent, uh, reasonably decent lifestyle uh, and provide for their future and for their retirement. Just the way the disruption that has come in the economy, that's no longer the case. So that has created tensions, as, 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 as all disruption does within, a, with, within an economy, that has created you know, real concerns amongst people. And the same is happening throughout Europe. And some of that, of course, is, as I said, as a result uh, of, of, of globalization. So to some extent, I think, the uh, cycle of activity and the focus on nationalism at the minute uh, is connected to the economic cycle. Perhaps the next economic cycle will uh, undermine to some extent the, the, um, the nationalism trends that have, have emerged, uh, but, but it won't happen on its own and it requires a, a continuous uh, level of education and people speaking out and identifying you know, the difficulties that arise from that sort of hyper-nationalism um, and to try to, to look towards the benefits of a sharing and pooling uh, of our sovereignty and our resources in a manner that will benefit all of us. Thank you. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, okay. So just to, I suppose, the point that was made about languages um, is a very, very important point, and it was something um, that actually came up last week on our visit um, to Brussels, and it was highlighted that particularly for Ireland, you know, we do have quite a poor uptake in terms of, of foreign languages, um, and it's something that we need to deal with at a national level, but it's concern. It, it was interesting to hear that it was so concerning at an EU level as well, because you rec like it was the first time I really recognised the fact that a lot of talent that's based here in Ireland is excluded from going working within the European institutions. Um, and I think that that is quite worrying and it's something that definitely needs to be addressed. Um, your point, um, I think we need both. So we need stronger institutions in terms of monitoring, but we also need the fund because it's not just one, there's no one simple solution to preventing crisis in the future. It's, it's a multitude of different things. But with the Commission, I'll give you an example overlooking it. A lot of the controversy with the current structure at the moment is that it's deemed to be operating in a a kind of a vacuum because of the way it was established outside of the treaties. Um, so really in terms of introducing the European Monetary Fund now, the whole idea is we bring it back in under the law and effectively we create this separate body, powerful, independent institution that will govern instead of the Commission. The thing is though is that the Commission became very political. How do we stop this independent entity from becoming very political also. So it's a challenge, but there's there's different aspects to it overall. So. Okay, thank you. Well, that's about it then for tonight. Um, I want to thank you all very much for coming. It, it really means a lot to us uh, coming down here and being able to have a good audience that are very engaged with the topic. Um, and I do hope you're able to you know, keep in touch with, with the Institute of International and European Affairs either online or um, in our in our events that we're holding in Dublin and, and around the country. And uh, especially I'd like to thank the four panelists for, for joining us this evening. I think it was a really uh, interesting and, and, and a very wide-ranging discussion uh, that I very much enjoyed, and I'm sure all the audience did. So thank you very much. Thank you.